Welcome back to the channel family and another podcast. My name is Paul. I'm in Peterhead in Scotland. Happy member of CA. And I'm really, really pleased to be joined today by Arthur. Yeah, thanks, Paul. My name's Arthur. I'm a recovered addict and I'm calling from the UK today. And Jess. Hey, family. My name's Jess. I'm a grateful recovered addict alcoholic calling in from Canada. Excellent. So the format today is we're going to be taking a look at the big book. We've each brought a topic and we're each going to share on each other's topic. Um, so that's the plan. If you're new to the channel or if you're still um, struggling with drug addiction, please check out the other podcasts. Um, there's around 65 on the channel now. Um, there's recordings on each of the steps. Uh, there's about 15 personal stories. Uh, an entire psychic change, the spiritual malady and the ABCs of addiction. So please check those out wherever you see this podcast uh, posted or broadcast, whether it's WhatsApp, Skype in the rooms or indeed on YouTube. Please feel free to reach out in the conversation below. Um, you can pause or rewind this or share this with us, wherever you will. Um, and, you know, um, please feel free, as I say, to reach out further on in the podcast. There'll be information about meetings online and face-to-face -face that you can get to where you can hear uh, the message regular and often uh, hope, faith and courage. So I'm really pleased to be joined today uh, by Arthur and Jess. So without further ado, Arthur, I'm going to hand it over to you. What have you got for us today? I'll put it up on the screen if you tell me what page it is. I've got page 62 um, from whatever our protestations to the end of the affirmation third step prayer, which is, may I do thy will always. Which is on page 63, yeah. So 62 yeah. to 63. So right, whatever. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So whatever our protestations, are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, or our self-pity, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows, and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly, seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and phil philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that there, hereafter, in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was, a, was the keystone of the new and triumphant arc, arch through which we passed to freedom. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all powerful, he provided what we, what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face, we could face life successfully, as we become conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. We were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker, as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that help of thy power, thy love and thy way of life. 
May I do thy will always. So my name's Arthur and I'm a recovered addict. And I'll talk a bit about the step three prayer in a minute, but selfishness, self-centeredness. Yeah, I was selfish to the core. I heard that in many times in the rooms. And yeah, I agree with that statement. I, I was that as well, selfish to the core. And if I look back through my life, what I did to my family, my friends, um, and what, what addiction did to me as well, not really seeing it and being self in delusion as well, being in self delusion and, and in self pity from what I had basically made these troubles out of my own making. Um, and then the beauty of it is, is turning it over, turning just a little bit towards God, stepping one, one step, putting one foot forward and stepping towards God. And he comes the rest of the way because um, God wasn't lost. I was lost. And, you know, this was the uh, this was the last stop in the station. This was the last station on the track for me, this uh, CA program. But it works. Um, and turning everything over to God as well is really important for me. You know, whether it be work, career, love, you know, in the future, all that sort of worry, that's sort of gone now. Um, I just hand it over to God and he will provide what I need, not what I want, because that's where my selfishness is, what I want, but what I need. Um, and I love that bit at the bottom of page 62. It says, next we decided that hereafter in this time of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. You know, and now I can... I can um, see that in so many different ways as well as to see that everyone is a child of God. Um, and if things go wrong as well, then that might be God's plan, you know? Might be time for me to step back and just um, accept, you know, that's it, accept thy will be done. May I do thy will always. And uh, the step three pair is for me, is the affirmation of the, of the step three. Um, I don't know if other people see it like that, but for me, it's definitely a, uh, an affirmation of my decision to turn my will and life over to the care of God as I understand him. Um, and it's basically a prayer of self-reduction as well. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will, not my will, thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those on help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. So I need God to reduce, reduce my selfishness and then me to be selfless. That's what it's saying here. Reduce the bondage, relieve me of the bondage of self and I better do thy will. Um, and God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. You know, and that's what I used to do with King Alcohol and King Cocaine. You know, as, I used to, as I used to call them, I might as well have got up and said, oh, King Cocaine, King, King Alcohol, what would you have to me do today? Build with me and do with me as thou you as thou wilt um because i was powerless and that was my power um although it came back like a boomerang and struck me cut me to ribbons this is um this is my one of my favorite prayers as well in this book i love it all but this is one of my favorite prayers um i feel like i'm rambling on now so i'll leave it there thank you brilliant share and a great bit of the book thanks so much arthur that was great to hear you and, and great share really strong passage uh jess do you want to just grateful recovered addict alcoholic wow arthur thank you so much for the reading and for your share um i love this part of the book you know selfishness self-centeredness that we think is the root of our troubles driven by a hundred forms of fear you know not just one type of fear, but self-delusion, self-seeking and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, you know, and this, this idea that, you know, oh, how dare they? And when I did like my last step four inventory, you know, I came up against pride and ego and this like, how dare you, you know, this righteous indignation of being hurt. And I love this because it just reminds me that like at some time in the past, I made a decision based on self where I placed myself in a position to be hurt, you know, and my troubles were definitely of my own making, 
you know, I was self well run riot out there. And I really like what was said about, you know, lack of power was my dilemma. You know, I lost the power of choice when it came to drinking and using. And I had no idea how much my life was driven by fear and self centeredness until I came into these rooms. I had many moral and philosophical convictions, but you know, it's like I talk about in the 12 and 12, the idea of the bankrupt idealist, you know, I, God was always there. God was always there. You know, um, I, I was the one that was lost and I had to get right with the idea of God when I came into these rooms, which was challenging for me. And I had a hard time when I came up against step three, you know, but I was really just faced with the idea that, you know, what I was doing was not working. And I remember reading this and reading the promises of step three, where it said, you know, I would become more and more interested in seeing what I could contribute to life. I could, I could become less and less interested in myself, in my little plans and designs. Like that's such an addict thing, you know, like my little plans and designs, everything, you know, was the getting and using and means and ways of getting and using more, you know, my whole life centered around drugs and alcohol and staying messed up 24 seven. And it was a very, very lonely and isolating place to be. Although at the time, you know, being delusional and thinking that my way of life was the only way of life, I, I didn't see, see the reality of the situation, you know? Um, at first, I didn't want to read the step three prayer as it was written in the book. My sponsor told me to take my time and come back with a step three prayer that I was okay with because it says the wording is quite optional. But, you know, I came back a week later and she said, so what do you have for me? And I said, I'm going to just read the prayer that's in the book because I realized that it was just semantics and that it was my pride and my prejudice that was turning it into some scary Catholic thing from my childhood, you know? Like, and I say the step three prayer every single morning, you know, every single morning I have to turn my thinking and my actions over to the care of a higher power, sometimes several times a day, you know, because I like to take my will back. I like to think I know what's best and try and jam that square peg into the round hole, you know, as I like to put it. But when I can just relax. And Please just take away my difficulty experience and with a power greater than myself to bear witness, to show others that, you know, not only does this program work, but that belief in a higher power is simply finding a God of my own understanding that can save me from an alcoholic or addict death and the insanity of the way that I was living before, you know. Um, it says this is only a beginning and if honestly and humbly made an effect sometimes a very great one was felt at once. This is just a beginning. This is just another part of one, two, and three that forms that. Who wouldn't want that, you know? That is what's on offer here and it's a beautiful thing. So thank you for letting me share on the reading. Really great to hear, Jess. Great message. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks for being here. Thanks for connecting with us. Uh, very strong message. Yeah, selfishness, self-centeredness. Uh, where's the drugs? Uh, let's get some more ever-increasing quantities. Um, more or as organised as possible. Um, living to use, using to live. Ways and means to get more. And uh, today it's not like that. You know, what a transformation. It's happened one day at a time it's been a long period of reconstruction that's what it's been and it still is a period of reconstruction you know that is what the process is for me and uh, you know not giving up you know with the gift of desperation i remember that gift uh, the gift of perseverance the gift of endurance uh, you know and sometimes just ruggedly and determinedly doing the next right thing in the grace of god you know um <clears throat> fear what a thing, Whew. fearful and defective, 
the human condition, the alcoholic condition, um, the pity committee. It's such a great reading, really is. Uh, I might not be much, but I'm all I think about. You know, um, what do they say, Arthur? Uh, Jess, it's the old saying, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. Um, you know, and in recovery, we, we find something of a balance and, and something of manageability. And my experience has been that it's produced by consistently doing the good things every day. You know, and um, as usual in my topsy-turvy world, I, I've actually just completed step three today with a man. We, we had a phone call first thing this morning and, and then one late afternoon. We've actually just completed step three in a day. Um, I'd only do it over a couple of days and, uh, you know, the commitment and the devotion. Um, I think it's very interesting to, to look at the spiritual principles that, um, that are the root of this program, things like transparency, accountability and willingness. You know, the willingness is expressed by the willingness to read the literature, the willingness to do a bit of service, the willingness to help others. You know, that's largely what how I see step three. You know, it's the devotion to the program, the meetings, the fellowship, the step work, the prayers, the meditation, and very importantly, the, the inventory of the night. You know, we keep an eye on our words and our behavior and our thoughts. Um, it's a very powerful bit of the book, Arthur. It really is. Uh, our troubles are basically of our own making. What a revelation that is. You know, I have a friend and when he shares, he says that in recovery, he discovered when he pays the electric bill, they don't cut him off. You know, uh, he discovered that if he pays the rent, he gets to keep his flat. You know, and, um, you know, I, rem I remember the candle and the cold baked beans, you know, but, but that was fine because I had my stash, right? You know, and that's the insanity of active addiction and we get restored to sanity and you know it's a total transferable where you know we get reasonably sane reasonably manageable and we're able then to help others um you know when i stop drinking uh my problems stop you know and and the solution began um Yeah, and, you know, that's a really important bit there where it says moral and philosophical convictions galore. I can remember sitting around with using addicts. Oh, will we ever quit? What will we do? Well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You know, the best made plans of mice and men. Let's do this. That's a plan. This weekend, tonight, that'll be it. When it gets to tomorrow, when this bit's gone, you know, six months later, well, you know, I know what I'll do. You know, in my opinion, it's far easier to stay clean than keep getting clean. And, um, you know, it is a daily program of action. I was talking with another man, a man that's really, really struggled today. I was talking to him and, uh, you know, and I said, well, it seems to me that, you know, you, your story sounds very similar to that of a chronic addict. I said, and only a, a proper daily program of action is going to be sufficient for you, you know, um, we have to have God's help. But here's the thing, you know, and this is something else I had to say to a man a little while ago. You know, he was very strong. You know, I've worked with Mohammedans, born-again Christians, Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists, but, um, Hindus. I've worked with with persons of, of all and no belief over the years, and anyone can get and stay free, whatever their personal beliefs are. And Conversely, whatever their personal beliefs are, if it was working out really good for them, they wouldn't end up in the rooms of 12-step recovery. You know, and I had to say that, I had to point that out to someone recently. Um, you know, the, these steps are a practical approach to the power, you know, a responsible approach to that power. And, um, yeah, it's, it's really a great reading. And, and I think... That paragraph there, Arthur, first of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Um, you know, the idea of accountability and authority, you know. Someone said to, uh, to, to, I think it was to Bob, they said, why was it the Oxford group wasn't anywhere near as successful as AA? He said, well, 
alcoholics like to be spoon fed, uh, you know, <laughs> spoon fed the truth. And so the, these are, uh, you know, a simple way to get some accountability and some transparency and some responsibility. Thanks so much for bringing that off up. And I'll pass it back to the group. Jess, what have you brought for us today? Thank you for your share, Paul. I got a lot out of that. I'm bringing us back into step two. So uh, page 53 from when we became alcoholics uh, to the bottom issue of 54. All right, just grateful recovered addict alcoholic. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? Arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. We could not duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason towards the desired shore of faith. The outlines and the promise of the new land had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands had stretched out in welcome. We were grateful that reason had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. Perhaps we had been leaving, leaning too heavily on reason that last mile and we did not like to lose our support. That was natural, but let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? For did we not believe in our own reasoning? Did we not have confidence in our ability to think? What was that but a sort of faith? Yes, we had been faithful, abjectly faithful to the God of reason. So in one way or another, we discovered that faith had been involved all the time. We found too that we had been worshippers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. Had we not variously worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves? And then with a better motive, had we not worshipfully beheld the sunset, the sea, or a flower? Who of us had not loved something or somebody? Who of us, how much did these feelings, these loves, these worships have to do with pure reason? Little or nothing we saw at last. And were not these things the tissue out of which our lives were constructed? Did not these feelings after all determine the course of our existence? It was impossible to say we had no capacity for faith or love or worship. In one form or another, we had been living by faith and little else. And imagine life without faith. Were nothing left but pure reason, it would not be life. But we believed in life, of course we did. We could not prove life in the sense that you can prove a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. Yet there it was. Could we still say the whole thing was nothing but a mass of electrons created out of nothing, meaning nothing, whirling on into a destiny of nothingness? Of course we could not. The electrons themselves seem more intelligent than that, at least so the chemist said. Wow, I, I love this, this part of the book, you know, because for me, as I mentioned before sharing on Arthur's reading, I did not come into and like it says you know I did not come into cocaine anonymous to find God I came here to get rid of a terrifying drug habit you know and this idea of being crushed by a self-imposed crisis I could not postpone or evade and there we are back again to write my problems are of my own making you know everything that was wrecked and broken and falling apart that put me in a place where I could not be sober and I could not keep doing what I was doing and I just wanted to die. All of that, you know, all of that was my doing. I, I 20 years of madness brought me to that point, you know, and I come to step two where I, Come to, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And only a junkie, only a junkie who is dying has to actually still pause and be like, well, do I really want to accept a spiritual solution or do I want to keep just wandering on to my, my you know, addict doom, you know? 
um, most people probably would be like, oh yeah, spiritual solution, let's check that out, you know? But this is it, right? Um, I found this reading really, really helpful for me because it really put it into perspective. Like it says, let's look at this more closely. Use your brain, right? Because I love to use my brain. And this part of the book where it says, talking about, you know, of course I had worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and myself. I worshipped drugs and alcohol. I thought they were the be all end all solution for absolutely everything, you know, good, bad, everything in between, you know, and I had looked at the ocean or sunset and wondered, you know, who made all of this and this idea, you know, like I, I cared about people, you know, I cared about getting drugs. I, I cared about myself to some extent, you know, at least in the context of my addiction, you know, um, this idea that all of these little things are, was what my life was made of, you know, and, and how much of this actually had anything to do with my intellect, with my brain power, with my ego, with my ability, more or less to think straight, at least again, in the context of being an active addiction, you know, I could not continue believing that everything was nothing, whirling on to a destiny of nothing, you know? So I was able to cross that bridge. I was able to still very much in my head, you know, they say, I hear in the rooms a lot, the longest journey is the one from the head to the heart. But this part of the book, We Agnostics, this chapter, it enabled me to use my my reasoning to use my intellect to actually use God was part of my life all along and that faith was already a part of my life so instead I had to continue doing what I was doing I had faith in my sponsor I had faith that in her higher power in her spiritual solution I believed that she was free of that obsession, that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, you know? So why couldn't that be me too, you know? And again, this is part of that arch, you know, steps one, two, and three that I put together, that arch that I can walk through into action, into freedom, you know? And I'm just really grateful, you know, Paul said, we need to be spoon fed. And that's true. You know, if I had walked in and they said, okay, you need to accept Jesus Christ into your life and you will be free from your substance abuse issues and all these other internal malady things. Cause I didn't have a drug and alcohol problem. I had a drug and alcohol solution. I, I would have walked right back out that door. You know, I'm pretty sure that my mom had that conversation with me a few times, you know, uh, but instead it was presented to me in a way that I was able to comprehend. And this idea that it is a God of my own understanding and it's something that is greater than myself that does not want me dead. Because I already believed if I've done my step one thoroughly and admitted powerlessness, if I've admitted powerlessness, I've already admitted that there is a power greater than me. It's just a power, you know, that wants me dead, that wants me suffering, that wants me angry for no reason all the time. And today I'm free of that. Today I have faith and I put my faith into action, but I have to do it every day, you know, but it was just such a relief that I could start on such a simple level, you know, and it says that up to this point in the book several times, you know, in Bill's story, and other chapters, it's like, it's, it's actually quite simple. It's just a beginning, That's it, right? I put my hand out and say, I'm ready to cooperate with grace and God stepped the rest of the way. And I really love that, how that was put. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'll stop there before I start rambling, but uh, it's really great beautiful be message thank you. To be thank you so much that was great thank you jess
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very good, very good set of points you make there about uh, faith and trust, and it is a great bit of the book. Um, yeah, and you know we had faith and trust in that pill portion plant powder or rock, didn't we? You know we had we had a lot of faith in that, even even when it turned out to be mixed with uh, with whatever. You know we were still determined to use it, right? You know if we got it, the madness of active addiction. Um, yeah, that's a really really good point you make about uh, you know we were we already admitted there was a higher power. There was something outside of us that was controlling us that wanted wanted our destruction, you know, whether you call that the devil, the disease, alcoholism, the dark side, the yang, we all know what we mean, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the great mysteries of God is, you know, when, when I go to a 12-step meeting, I almost, almost always hear what I need to hear in such a fashion that it is absolutely amazing <laughs> it's, like, it's like almost every time like well that's amazing you know and, and it, if it's odd it's god you know and uh I, I know through experience that that god keeps his anonymity in 12-step meetings you know I've, I've experienced it countless times you know and I, and I think one day every man and woman and child will see god say ah so it was you and god will say yeah I kept you safe through all that. Uh, and then I gave you this wisdom and that courage and that serenity. And everyone will go, really? I've got to say, really? You know, and I think that's that's the process of recovery. Because for me, it's a journey of the truth. You know, I remember I worked with him two years ago and, you know, and I would say to him, you know, you must learn to think the truth and speak the truth and live the truth. And uh, he never forgot it. And he still, he occasionally says it to me now, two years later, and uh, he's added his own bit onto it. The truth will never lie to you, you know, and he's stayed clean. And, you know, the journeys we make, uh, you know, the, the, the understanding we get, the gleanings we get are very precious as we stay clean um, and in the solution. Um, more will be revealed, you know. Um, it says there either God is everything or God God is nothing. And it, the idea, I think, of accountability is really every thought, word and deed has to be suitable to God. That's how I see it. You know, and any any deviation from that is a journey where drink or drugs could be at the end of that journey. You know, and, and I've come to realize that, you know, untreated alcoholism and, and for me, alcoholism is addiction. Addiction is alcoholism. Um, it's similar to if you take that first one, that first one wants another one, and that one wants another four. And six months later, when your money's gone, your wife's gone, your job's gone, your health and your mind are going, you're wondering what's going on. Um, you know, that's the progression of the illness. Um, well, untreated alcoholism's like that. If you allow one resentment, uh, lust, greed, anger, hatred, envy, all that good stuff. If you allow any of that, um, then that one wants another one. And that one wants another one. You might as well just allow something else. It's a slippery slope. Um, it talks about walked far over the bridge of reason towards the desired shore of faith. This outlines the promise of the new land. Yeah, I remember saying to a man some time ago, you know, it was like a wounded lion that fresh back from the battles of life. You know, and, and it's a time of healing. Uh, you know, it, it's a long period of reconstruction for many of us. Um, yeah. And, and another thing I've seen is, is folks that come in very antagonistic about a higher power or God, you know, and, uh, you know, they pick arguments and things like this over the topic. And then six months later, I think there's something going on. What's going on? I think it's God. Yes, we know it's God. We've been telling you for six months and you've been getting on at us. Um, and I've seen folks have that transformation, sometimes more than six months, you know, and they they realize that it's God at work in their lives. And uh, for me, conscious contact begins before step one, you know, and um, 
and on. I'll leave it. I'll leave it with this, Jess, because it's such a great topic. I could talk on this topic all night. I was talking to another man today, um, and he said, "Oh, he said, I, I said, do you have any kind of faith in a higher power or anything?" He says, "Oh no," I said, "I don't believe in in in, in God or a higher power." I says, "He says, but I was angry at God earlier." <laughs> I said, "Well." You can't have it both ways. You can't say there's no God and then say you're angry. Oh, I see, I see what you mean. <laughs> you know, so I mean, most persons believe that there is a creator. You know, that I, I've met very few honest atheists, you know, largely agnostics, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know, you know, and that's the journey and the process of recovery. And, and I'll leave it there. Arthur, come on in. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for your share. And uh, thank you, Jess, for bringing this topic. It's brilliant. Um, again, my name's Arthur. I'm a recovered addict. Uh, where it says God is everything or else he is nothing, God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? Um, when I went through the book with the man who came before me, my sponsor, he made me underline that and call that step two promise, you know, God is everything. And um, you know, I have to sometimes look at my current agnosticism, you know, where I think I can control the show because, um, as Jess rightly put it before about taking will back and that's so easily done. Um, for me personally, I can do that as well. And, um, just handing it over. Um, another thing that, you know, when I was in treatment, um, I come up with this affirmation, which was, you know, this program will definitely work for me. God will work for me and I will be successful in this program. Um, and I haven't had to use that for a long time because the program works. That's something I just came up with in to get me through treatment. And you know what? I see God work in my life more than ever now, although he was always there. And it's quite funny. I can see God working in other people's lives very easily because uh, God's very old, you know, he's quite, he can be, sometimes he can be slow and sometimes he's quick. He's all, he's at all places at once. So he's got a lot on. And, um, you know, so seeing it in my own life, it's, uh, I've heard it before. It's like looking in the mirror and watching your hair grow sometimes, but seeing it in others, when you see them a week later, two weeks later, you see them glowing and lighting up and, um, you see the hand of God working in action. And if I look back through my recovery life and through my, life in addiction as well I can see him working through my life um and also said the god of reason yes we've been faithful objectively to faithful to the god of reason which comes back to sort of um have we yeah but a sort of faith have we had it's almost like for me self-reliance and now we're god reliant um yeah I love this passage I love this passage and you know that there is a solution to the to the drinking now uh, drinking drugging problem god is the solution uh, and our higher powers can do what we could not do for ourselves and this is where the hope comes in you know it only talks about uh drugs or or substances in the first step and after that it's a program of self-reduction and god reliance and helping others and helping god's children yeah, I really like this passage, Jess. Thank you so much for bringing it to the table. Um, yeah, I absolutely love this passage. New land, bad brought lustre of, of tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging, flagging spirits. Absolutely, my, my spirit was flagging. My spirit was um, wavering in the life of, of turmoil and in addiction, misery, terror and pain of addiction. And the opposite of that is hope, faith, and courage, which is on our key rings, and it's our motto as CA. And it's a, it's a polar opposite. And, you know, God of your own understanding, God of my understanding, gives me that, that I hope, the faith. I see the hope in other people's lives to have the faith in my life and the courage to continue to do the work. And, yeah, when I was truly done drinking drugs, when I was broken, um, that's when I grabbed this program with both hands. You know, I've been in, in and out for a while, but this this time round, it was it was it. And God, uh, God, the hand of God smashed down and said, "You're not doing this anymore. You're not doing this anymore." So I give it. I give my program. Put it all into my program, and and it works. 
and helping others massive massive thing i've just started sponsoring a couple of gentlemen and i'm um, seeing seeing the, the hand of god in their lives is beautiful yeah absolutely beautiful thank you so much jess for bringing us to the meeting thank you brilliant thanks arthur so i've got a little portion here on page 129 there it is um so there we go halfway down um if the family will appreciate that dad's current behavior or indeed anyone's current behavior recoveries but a phase of their development all will be well in the midst of an understanding and sympathetic family these vagaries of dad's spiritual infancy will quickly disappear and recovery does feel like that sometimes you know it's a process. The opposite may happen should the family condemn and criticise. Dad may feel that for years his drinking has placed him on the wrong side of every argument. But now he has become a superior person with God on his side. Oh, yes. If the family persists in criticism, this fallacy may still take a greater hold on father. Instead of treating the family as he should, he may retreat further into himself and feel he has spiritual justification for so doing. Though the family does not fully agree with dad's spiritual activities, they should let him have his head, even if he displays a certain amount of neglect and irresponsibility towards the family. It is well to let him go as far as he likes in helping other alcoholics. During those first days of convalescence, this will do more to ensure his sobriety than anything else. Though some of his manifestations are alarming and disagreeable, we think dad will be on a firmer foundation than the man who is placing business or professional success ahead of spiritual development. He will be less likely to drink again and anything is preferable to that. Those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have eventually seen the childishness of it. This dream world has been replaced by a sense of great purpose accompanied by a growing consciousness of the power of God in our lives. We've come to believe he would like us to keep our heads in the clouds with him, but that our feet ought to be firmly planted on earth. That is where our fellow travellers are, and that is where our work must be done. These are the realities for us. We've found nothing incompatible between a powerful spiritual experience and a life of sane and happy usefulness. One more suggestion, whether the family has spiritual convictions or not, they may do well to examine the principles by which the alcoholic member is trying to live. They can hardly fail to approve these simple principles, though the head of the house still fails somewhat in practicing them. Nothing will help the man who is off on a spiritual tangent so much as the wife who adopts a sane spiritual program, making a better practical use of it. So my thought is practical spirituality and what it looks like in the home, because that's where the demonstration of the program has to be in the home. Um, It's really, really interesting, and I've seen this play out several times. Folks, you know, they encounter faith and trust. They go through a powerful, transformative 12-step experience. And that does often place them on a place of, how would I describe it, emotional and spiritual mental well-being that is higher than, than those in their family. Um, and yet the persons in their family uh, still may not have forgiven them. Um, or got over all the damage and carnage and they're singing and dancing and everything's wonderful um, and so it's a very interesting paradox um, and you know it, it's where wisdom and discretion come in I think knowing how to handle oneself in the midst of where persons have not got over all the damage of active addiction and yet the addict themselves uh, is doing really well and sometimes they resent his well-being or his happiness. You know, how dare you be so happy after all the trouble you've caused? You know, when we read elsewhere about the man after the tornado that comes up out of the cellar 
says, oh, no, it's a grand day. Everything's all right here. You know, and um, I think, you know, that's where spiritual gifts come in, learning to be discreet in, in recovery. Um, and it's quite interesting. It talks about dad going off on a tangent. That, that's another thing we have to watch out for in sobriety. It's easy to get imbalanced or militant about this bit of the book or this bit of the programme, when really the ancient proverb says that the man or woman of God has balance. Balance is the great gift, you know, emotional deflation, uh, ego deflation, emotional maturity. Anyway, I think I'll just wrap it up with this and hand it over to you, um, Arthur. Um, you know, and it says there the importance of spiritual growth and spiritual development, because that is the thing that will give you insurance and immunity against the first drink. You know, two things, working with others and building the relationship with God. Um, a growing consciousness of the power of God. And this last bit here is a personal favourite of mine where it says, We've come to believe that he would like us to keep our heads in the clouds with him, but that our feet ought to be firmly planted upon earth, because that is where our fellow travellers are, and that is where our work must be done. These are the realities for us. We've found nothing incompatible between a powerful spiritual experience and a life of sane and happy usefulness. And I'll just pass it back to the group. Do you want to come in, Arthur? Yeah, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> thank you for that for that reading. It's brilliant. Um, I love where it says, uh, I had to just look up this word, convalescence. It's the period of time recovering from an illness. A period of time, you know. And um, during those first days of convalescence, this will do more. So just before that, it says, even if you displays a certain amount of neglect and irresponsibility towards the family, it's well to let him go as far as he likes. In helping other alcoholics during these first day, those first days of convalescence, this will do more to more to ensure his sobriety than anything else. Yeah, working with others, absolutely, is a beautiful thing. Um, certainly for me, I could never even, in my wildest dreams, never even imagine that I would be helping others. I've always dreamt of being able to help others and dreamt of being unselfish, but um, I didn't have the power to muster up. Only God, only God had that and has that. And um, yeah, I like as well. It says there, uh, we would like us to keep our. He would like us to keep our heads in the clouds with him. So basically, our thoughts, um, turning our thoughts over to God and what God's will for us is, and the knowledge of His will for us, and the power to carry that out. That's what I get from that. But our feet ought to be firmly planted on the earth. Um, in helping others and helping God's children. That is where our fellow travellers are and that is where our must, work must be done. These are the realities for us. Realities as well, I love that. Just even that simple word, uh, word realities. My reality was absolutely warped in addiction. Um, absolutely wrong. My thinking was wrong. My, my reality was warped. And I couldn't even see the amount of pain I caused other people, um, let alone myself, but other people as well. I, could, I couldn't even see it in myself. Um, and then this spiritual program of action, very strong word, action. You know, it's not into thinking or into pondering or into figuring. It's into action, that other chapter. And, and it is a program of action a program of action to help others and by doing that we we ensure our own sobriety yeah um my family i could say one thing about my family my family have not been haven't been happier so you know i don't think i've ever seen them happier since i've come into ca their um their lives have changed as well the ripple effect as people were here people call it in the rooms the ripple effect of addiction is again another polar opposite to the ripple effect of recovery and yeah sometimes slowly sometimes quickly in that regard as well in the regard of of family and friends being able to trust us again you know it took me a while to trust god so it's going to take them a while 
to trust that God's working through me, um, even if they might not have the same beliefs or, or the same spiritual program as me, it's going to be a little while till they can trust that I'm do, you know, doing what I can to stay sober, um, stay in this program. But um, yeah, my, my, my dad hasn't had a arterial fibrillation attack since I've come in here, which says it all really to me. You know, he'd have them all the time when I was out using and wouldn't speak to, speak to them for months, six months at a time. So um, this program's worked wonders for me and for the people around me as well. I see it in other people's lives so, so well. Um, thank you for bringing that topic, Paul. That's great. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, Arthur. Great message. Jess, come on in. Thank you for the reading, Paul. There's some really good stuff in the family afterward. Um, you know, just grateful recovered addict, alcoholic. It's funny, you know, like you were talking earlier about how we always hear exactly what we need to hear. I just love how all the readings that we chose without any conversation beforehand, they all go together so well. And I was actually reading in, uh, 83 earlier you know where it says the spiritual life is not a theory we have to live it you know and it says like let's not go on incessantly about all the spiritual things you know our our actions will convince them louder than our words you know and you know the person I was in a relationship with when I got sober and started to have a spiritual experience and started to practice these principles and you know really start to change you know, he was not a spiritual person, you know, but I found that we were able to find balance in that and that because I wasn't trying to cram the program down his throat, he started to change as a result of my behavior and my actions, our relationship started to change and become more healthy as a result, even though, you know, to the extent that he was also still struggling with his own addiction issues. And I just, I, I love this because it reminds me that, you know, I can sit around and I can talk about God and I can talk about spiritual experiences and all of these things, but I'm not a saint. It is progress, not perfection. And that, you know, I have to, I have to remember that I get a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And the, my maintenance of my spiritual condition is, you know, doing service, trust God, help others clean house, right? Because if my own house is not in order, I can't transmit something I haven't got. If I'm telling my sponsees, you know, making suggestions, oh, prayer, meditation, inventory, uh, you know, I'm very honest with my sponsees, you know, I'm like, I, I suggest you do inventory. It's a really good idea. I'm struggling with inventory right now myself. You know, I'm candid about where it, I struggle with these things because I'm human and because my sponsor always stressed the importance of right sizeness, humility, you know, and remaining teachable. Uh, I also just, that last paragraph, those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have eventually seen the childness of it. I have all of that paragraph there highlighted. You know, the idea of this world of spiritual make-believe, it brings me back to, you know, Paul, you mentioned it too, you know, we sit around, high out of our minds and talk about you know though the meaning of life in the universe and i'm going to do this and i'm going to change that and i'm going to make a difference and then you know it's like oh actually i have to go make money to do more drugs to make money to do more drugs you know and today that dream world those windy arguments that really led nowhere has definitely been replaced by a great sense of purpose accompanied by a growing consciousness of the power of God in my life. And, you know, Arthur said it really well. I don't always see the hand of God in my life, but I do believe that God works through other people. I really do because I come on a meeting and I hear what I need to hear or I'm struggling and a sponsee calls me and they're struggling, you know, and they need someone to talk to. Or, you know, it's time to go down to the river with my dog and just meditate on a rock, you know, because someone else decided that today was a good day to go sit by the river and meditate on a rock, you know. I have to keep my feet firmly planted on this earth, 
you know, and to the extent that I trust God to work in my life and to keep me safe and protected, you know, I am enabled to match calamity with serenity. And the, this is the reality for me, you know, today I have a life of sane and happy usefulness. You know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And as an addict, I struggled with a lack of purpose and a lack of connection. And I found that everything that I was looking for out there in the madness on that journey, you know, that I'm grateful for today because it led me here. I found all of that in the rooms of 12 step recovery, you know, and I just, I love the fact that this is on offer and it's open and it's available to absolutely anyone. You know, they say the only things that are indispensable that cannot be given to someone are honesty, open-mindedness and willingness, you know? Um, yes, I will wrap it up. Um, but yeah, I'm just really, really grateful to be here. And I just wanna say, you know, stay connected, get connected. This program works. Uh, there is a way out, you know, we are here and we are free and there is a solution. We do recover from addiction from that seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Thank you both for the readings today and for this meeting. Uh, I really got a lot out of it. And I, you know, I love being of service. Service saves my life on a daily basis. So thank you for my recovery today. And I wish everyone on the channel a very, very good 24. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jess. Great to hear you. Great message as always. Thanks so much for your time today, you too, Arthur. Um, yep, so meetings on the screen are some meetings. There are thousands of meetings. You're welcome at them all. Um, these are just some of them on the screen. Um, so we are often to preparing a group called We Can Recover that's on at 2 p.m., 8 p.m., and 9 30 every day. That's UK times. Um, there are lots of other meetings. There are meetings on uh, round the clock every day, and you're welcome at them all. If you're in Great Britain at the top, cocaineanonymous.org.uk, that's a website where you can find out, um, well, indeed, wherever you are in the world, you can find out about online meetings at that address. But if you're in Britain and you're looking for a face-to-face -face meeting, you'll also get details of face-to-face -face meetings uh, on that website. Um, so there's lots of help out there, lots of resources. Stay connected, stay strong. Um, yeah, and that brings us to the end of today's broadcast. As I said, if you want to get involved in the conversation, please put in the chat wherever you see this posted or broadcast. And um, please come along to a meeting where you can hear uh, more of the message of hope and freedom that an addict, any addict, can quit using, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. Okay, thanks so much for your time, Arthur. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Jess. Um, and thank you, everyone, for listening. God bless you all. It's been great. It's been great to be of service. Thanks for being here. And thanks to you, Jess, once again, for your time. Oh, thank you, Paul and Arthur. It's a privilege to be here. And yeah, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this broadcast. Okay, family, stay strong, stay safe.